Uh, these guys are going to get up and talk about building global communities, what's happening in Waterloo, Iceland, and Halifax, everywhere else in the world. Welcome to the last panel. So my name is Permajot Valia. We've got an excellent panel from all over the world. We've got Steve Curry from Communitech. We've got Voya from both uh, Belgrade and San Francisco. We've got Bala from Iceland, India, America, everywhere in between. And we've got Mike, who has worked in uh, Boulder, Colorado, uh, Toronto, and is now, actually, we work together in New York with the Canadian Technology Accelerator. So I'm going to actually ask you all, if you don't mind, to give us a 30-second introduction, very much in the context of what we're talking about today, which is what are the lessons we can learn that, uh, from around the world with the exciting stuff that's happening that we can apply here in, uh, in Nova Scotia. So over to you, Steve. OK, great. Uh, thanks, Permjot. Um, Great to be here. Hopefully, you don't mind hearing from another speaker, another individual from Waterloo. But uh, <laughs> the good news is, I think there are a lot of similarities between uh, Halifax and Waterloo. And hopefully, we can learn from each other and help, uh, help each other as well. Uh, just a little bit about Communitech. Uh, organization started 17 years ago by a group of entrepreneurs and founders who each slapped uh, some money on a table and said, hey, we need an organization that can be the voice of the tech community. And uh, Communitech was born. It's grown over the years. Uh, we are still led by founders and entrepreneurs. So John Baker, who just spoke, uh, is the chair of our board. And all of our board members are CEOs and, and founders of, uh, of their companies. Um, we'll get into it a little bit uh, later as far as what we think uh, you know, some of the key things that might be good for Halifax to consider based on some of the lessons we've learned. But I'll hand it off to uh, my colleagues. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Voya. Um, I'm based in San Francisco the last 20 years. And I invest in companies from uh, Southeast Europe and help them uh, come to the United States and, and uh, global markets. Um, that's maybe a 30 second for me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Boya. Bala, if I could have yeah. a 30 second um, introduction. Glad to be here in Halifax. And we realize we are between you and beer, so we'll try to keep it short. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I live in Iceland. Uh, I'm sure by the resemblance you know I'm a Viking. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm far away from Viking blood as can be. Uh, but I am the founder of Startup Iceland. Um, started on this journey right after the financial collapse in Iceland. And uh, in a very quick, short five years, uh, I think Iceland has kind of reinvented itself. And, um, you know, I played a small role in it, but I think the community is, you know, there are some players in the community here. I think they're starting to migrate into Halifax, which is a great thing for Halifax, I think, and it's great for Iceland. So I'm glad to share that experience. Mike. Mike Freire. And Mike Freire. And uh, yeah, so I guess I started in Boulder, Colorado. We were one of the first tech startups companies and really got to experience that small, closed community there of startups, which was wonderful. Uh, then moved to Toronto for a bit. And then from there to, to New York City uh, to experience all kinds of different um, startup communities there and uh, relevant to here uh, yeah I'm, I'm a bit of a startup tourist as uh, I think someone <laughs> dubbed yesterday uh, so I've been in about 40 countries in the last few years just through work and everywhere I go I like to see what the startup communities are doing and their co-working spaces and that so uh, just seen a lot and like to bring it back to New York or spread it with wherever I go so I'm going to just pick on that point, Mike. You mentioned co-working spaces. Let's just start straight with that. How important are they? Yeah, I think they're extremely important. Uh, you know, in, in Boulder, there was a coffee shop that we all went to, and it eventually went out of business because we were there so long. Uh, <laughs> it, it, the coffee shop is great. It's a great way to start it. But uh, at the end of the day, people need somewhere to work and somewhere to meet. And these guys don't really know. I mean, it's usually kind of just uh, it's organic and sparks, and hey, let's meet up here, and we use whatever space we can. Uh, but and folks in the community from the university might say, hey, we have this great space here. Or, or the library is, is something that w that's happening in New York a lot is the libraries aren't being used anymore. And uh, why not host your startup there, have maker nights, have that kind of thing. Um, so there's the space. The spaces are absolutely critical, uh, either for event space, stuff like this, or just for working during the day. So, Bala, why did, um, you know, Iceland, um, why did it actually... Why did it need a startup movement in 2008? It's the, it's the last thing I would think of. You went there to run a bank. I think you've got the distinction of being the first person to have both opened and closed a bank within three months. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's been a great uh, tagline in my resume. <laughs> but uh, luckily, after the financial collapse, I haven't had to look for a job. And um, I, you know, Iceland has been you know, in the news for all the different reasons, but there's been... Um, 
kind of a grassroots initiative that started actually, you know, kind of leading from the co-working space, an abandoned seafood factory. You know, in Iceland, it's got something to do with seafood. <laughs> it has to be something to do with fish. The first place where I met an entrepreneur was in a abandoned seafood factory. They created a co-working space in a in a abandoned building right after the collapse, and that collapse more or less kind of reignited the entrepreneurial spirit in Iceland, in my opinion. And that created a lot of uh, free thinking. People wanted to do something different, and they kind of wanted to ask themselves what to do next. And you know, and, and kind of had somebody like me to facilitate that a bit. I just went and started asking questions. You know, I'm, I'm different, I'm not an Icelander, so I ask weird questions, and that kind of led one thing to another, and the community started coming, uh, that's how we started. But was the was the community was there something that because of the collapse perhaps that made the community ready for startup? I would think so. I really do think so because uh, for those of us who've been on the inside, the financial collapse didn't feel anything like you know what maybe you saw it from here. Mm. Uh, I had friends from the U.S. who were asking me, uh, "Do we need to send food? Are you guys okay?" You know, <laughs> we're like. You know, we have plenty of food and water. That's not the problem. <laughs> um, so the the collapse kind of uh, was a more a personal psychology hit for Iceland as a community. And when you go through some kind of a trauma like that, I think you kind of start asking tough questions and start going deep and figuring out what to do next. So I think um, I, I always say don't waste a good crisis. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a good point. And we're, we're going to talk about community tech in terms of, you know, looking beyond the crisis. Uh, but one of the things that I think those of us from Nova Scotia, well, as you can probably get, uh, gather from accent, I'm not from Nova Scotia, but I'm, I'm very committed to the region. My family, my family live here. Um, but um, the, the, the thing that we, we in Nova Scotia appreciate is the, the depth of the problems and startups, as uh, I think many of us have realized, one of the, uh, one of the answers to uh, you know, uh, you know, moving forward and moving ahead. So one of the things that, one of the examples that we keep looking to, it's been interesting when I went to Community Tech, how many people I bumped into from uh, you know, I, I saw so many people uh, f from Nova Scotia in Community Tech when I was there. So Community Tech is seen as this, this great example of how to create a startup community, startup cluster. Why does Community Tech work, Steve? Yeah, um, <coughs> it's uh, it's not quite just adding water and uh, and watch it grow, but. Um, Really, you know, community tech is very much about being a connector and a catalyst for the tech community, and uh, we see that role as kind of flowing through uh, through the whole tech ecosystem and being an enabler, uh, which is really critical. Um, you know, a couple of the key ingredients that we see in our region, and I think you, you've got the the makings here as well, is is access to talent is absolutely critical, and you need either a talent factory of some kind or a reason why talent wants to come to your come to your region, and so that's. Um, kind of the engine that fuels a lot of the, uh, the, the tech and, and startup uh, activity. Secondly is that density. It's very difficult when you spread out your activities and there's lots of distance to be covered. And so if there can be focal points, it doesn't have to be just one, but a couple of key focal points, it's really, really critical. So there's that center of gravity for the tech community to, uh, to rally behind and, and really use as a, as a focal point. And then lastly is the collaboration. <clears throat> I mean, no ecosystem is perfect. And uh, we all have our differences, even in Waterloo Region. And uh, it's really critical that uh, you know, people learn to, uh, to work together and for the greater good. I, I would say I have the, the benefit of, I guess, maybe being uh, the Canadian rep here on the, on the panel. Um, when you look around at what's happening internationally, it's, it's actually kind of scary. The competition, the bar has been raised tremendously. We in Canada have to get our shit together. We have, we have to punch above our weight. Uh, we are the small guys. I mean, Waterloo Region has a population of half a million people. We have to kind of be united and really good at promoting what we do beyond our, the borders of our city. So uh, that's something we can maybe explore later. I'd, I'd love to explore that. I think one of the things, I mean, uh, Voya, we actually met in Boulder, and yeah. uh, I had the great pleasure of meeting uh, Brad. And uh, one of the things that really struck me was when he speaks about communities have to include everyone, anyone who wants to play. And I think all of us will know that that is something, and I'm guilty of this, we do very badly. We tend to be very, this is my bit, don't step on my toes. How do we stop being such prima donnas? Pala, how did you manage to 
get people to play, you know, play well, play nice? Well, you know, first is I didn't know what I was doing, so that was <laughs> probably the first thing. Because uh, when when you are trying to figure it out yourself, uh, the best way is to be open about things. And I also feel that uh, you know having a mentality of scarcity was having a mentality of abundance. You know, when you're in a small community, there's always this mentality of scarcity that you know we are only small, so the best way to slice the pie is this way. But if we can just change our thinking a little bit and say, you know, the world is our oyster because everybody who's connected can build things. I was just listening to a speaker earlier in the day was talking about you can build a startup from anywhere today. And there are examples out of Iceland where people, you know, small villages of 3,000 people, there is a startup that does $3 million a year. And all that lady does is sell dress up dolls. Okay. That's all she does, and that's pretty cool. So we need to have open sharing community, and building it from anywhere and doing it with an abundance mentality is the key, at least uh, I felt that. And constantly repeating that, right? Because we tend to forget, and we kind of start falling into our own cracks and say, hey, this is what I do, this, you know, don't come here. But if we think about what are we doing this for, why are we doing this, right? Why a vibrant community? Right, and, and and if you ask those questions, then the answers come automatically. So, Voya, one one of yeah. the questions I'd, I'd like to ask you is: so we we met in uh, in the states. You've been in San Francisco now for twenty twenty five years. Yeah. Uh, but then you decided to personally fund uh, um, a startup uh, facility and support companies. So you've done that out of your own personal funds with no government support whatsoever yep. in Belgrade. Why? Well, um, uh, it had to be done. Uh, because waiting for the government, it, it, uh, it's, it's great, but the government, government needs to be leveraged in the appropriate way. And, and in a sense, they need to provide an infrastructure and provide a way to you know, pr um, build a highway, but not attempt to build the cars. And, and, and I think if government is engaged in a proper way, they're great. But, uh, but um, we shouldn't wait for that, shouldn't expect them to lead. Uh, just by their structure, they're not structured to lead uh, this type of innovation. Uh, and um, it's also interesting, and, and sort of the parallels between Halifax and, and Serbia or Iceland, uh, um, all small, small regions, and, and, and uh, um, there's always something. Serbia has a large uh, software outsourcing uh, um, business now, so that becomes a fertile ground that needs water, but, but I felt that the water will be, and, and that's, a, that's a big shift that the community needs to make. It's sort of the, the mindset. And, and, and because certain sort of industries and way of doing business have been established in, in, these, in these regions. Uh, um, so I felt that bringing like Silicon Valley DNA into the mix will spark something. And, and not trying to do Silicon Belgrade because that <coughs> uh, Silicon Valley shouldn't be, n nobody should attempt to replicate that and anywhere else, it's just a very specific, unique organism. But to, to bring that way of thinking to your community and then let it let it uh, uh, germinate into something new um, was, I think, very important. And, and uh, by, by doing that, it, it, it has many um, dimensions. But for example, one thing we, we try to do, do meetups every month, month, bring people from San Francisco or, or London uh, to, to spark that and have an open meetup, have a um, mentor session with startups, meet uh, local mentors and, and LPs. I think uh, uh, sort of cultivating uh, uh, investor community is very important as well. Uh, so, so, uh, but you know, wherever there is that bigger dis uh, uh, disconnect and and, uh, and a disruption, it it really I is that big of an opportunity, uh, and um, uh, I I, I want to pursue that opportunity. So, what I'm hearing, uh, I'm getting this flavor already. Of it's about individuals stepping up. So, I'm gonna I've, I've ripped this from Brad Feld, and thank you, Val, for reminding me. So, I just want to ask a quick question to the audience. Could you just put your hands up if you are involved in a startup? Or you are leading a startup. I think Jeff, you can still put your hand up. So, so <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, if you if you could put your hand up, keep your hands up, please, please. And could you please uh, just put your hands down if you are not uh, going to be staying in Halifax or in your cities, wherever cities you come from, for the next ten years. So keep your hands up if you are committed to staying in those cities uh, for the next ten years. Fab. Now keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. So now, which, who of you is going to commit 
to stepping up and becoming a leader of the community? Keep your hands up. Stand up. Stand up. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. you Thank you, Brian. Stand up if you are committed to be. Stand up, please. Stand up. Because you are the leaders. Yeah. So everybody, <laughs> these... Thank you, Violet. Words. Thank you. So you are the leaders. You get involved. Get involved. It's about individuals, and all of you can make. Um, I was going to go to the cameraman there, but obviously you stood up for other reasons. <laughs> but uh, all of you are involved. You are all the leaders of, of the startup community, and I think we keep talking about entrepreneur-led, entrepreneur-led. Don't wait for permission. Make yourself heard. So that that brings me back to really Steve, uh, you with Community Tech. Who are the leaders that have stepped forward? How do you actually manage? Because I think your, uh, your turnover, your, your revenues are about 23 million uh, a year, something like that. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you manage that level of complexity and still stay a grassroots movement? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, we've, we've grown a lot over the years. And um, to the point where I, I would say we're, we're both a public and privately funded organization. And um, we have a goal over the next few years to actually reduce the amount of government assistance or funding that we're getting for our programming. Um, uh, but really, it's, it's the tech community that is involved. So our board members are all uh, entrepreneurs and founders. Um, we really, it's the notion of, I don't know, has anybody heard the term PayPal mafia? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's that concept where, uh, you know, people who have had exits or have been involved in successful companies then turn around and do something else and get, get involved in. But that's really critical for a lot of communities. So we've had the benefit of companies, say, like a Pickstream who had a, a nice exit and, and many of the founders there went off and, and did a whole bunch of other things. And even the BlackBerry guys, some of the early BlackBerry people, and uh, we're seeing a lot of that. Um, so it's that kind of reinvigorating of the, the entrepreneurial spirit and getting people engaged that way. And then also at the kind of grassroots student, um, even starting with, with the students. So this past weekend, uh, there were four or five students that, at the University of Waterloo that had this great idea of let's just create a big hackathon and see what we can do with it. And it was called Hack the North, and they had, they had this, the cap registrations at 1,000 hackers. And uh, they had all sorts of uh, great sponsors. I think they had Apple and Bloomberg and whatever else. That was just the students that organized that. And it just grew to this massive event. And, and so you know, being there as an organization that can help support those kinds of things is, is what we try to do. But really trying to um, create that initiative within the individuals to do that kind of great thing. I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask the audience uh, participation to you know step forward questions. But I wanted to ask Mike something because Mike, you've actually got the experience of being deeply involved in the startup community in Boulder, mm -hmm. in uh, Toronto, and New York. So you have East Coast, West Coast, and um, Canadian experience. Mm -hmm. From an ecosystem perspective, what are the key things for an entrepreneur? Well, for I mean, I'd say in both. I mean, when I was in Boulder, it was there was if there was any tech event. Everybody was there. <laughs> it didn't matter what field it was in, and that was great. I really loved that because you, you got diverse experience of different technologies. Uh, when you needed someone who, when you needed an Ajax developer, you met someone at, at, at that conference beforehand, and you could pull them in. So you, it was really nice to pull different, various, uh, diverse set of resources within Boulder. Um, whereas in New York and Toronto, not to, to put them in the same boat, but they're, they're very similar in this regard, um, it's, it's very specific. So. If, you, if you're in financial tech and in the startup industry, that's all you really need. There's a community of a few hundred people just in that particular community in startups. Um, people say there's not a big tech scene. Well, now, there, now there's a big tech scene in New York. Um, and it's also, it's almost to a, to a fault. The New York tech meetup, I don't know, it's 5,000 and the tickets go within 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. You can't get to the New York tech meetup if you tried. Um, there's big names there and everything, but it's also, it's kind of, it's too, it's too broad. Uh, I think we're getting to the point now where using online communities, we can now find those, those, those right people in our right community there pretty easily. So, you know, I suggested to entrepreneurs to show up to, to random event, not necessarily random, um, ultra specific, but also branch out a little bit and get involved in the other sectors. I mean, if you're in New York, for example, go to the, the PR and the media events. There's a whole industry there, even though you're focusing on the maker movement. 
um, you still should be involved there because they're doing cool things in tech and they're also going to be useful to you in the future uh, building that network. It'd be great to hear actually so that we, we get really the most out of yep. this panel. If, if, you could have, if we could have some questions, but also if we could have some observations on what you think the pain points of the Halifax uh, Atlantic ca uh, Canadian ecosystem is. I mean, uh, the, the great exciting thing about the region, which I, 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 I'm not sure you're aware of, but Jeff Thompson is also now chairman of Propel ICT, which is now the, uh, I'd say, the premier organization in terms of offering programming and support for entrepreneurs. Launch 36, uh, the alumni of Launch 36 is, is huge. Uh, we've actually had uh, some of the entrepreneurs presenting today. Um, some of the companies you met at Mentor Camp uh, came from Launch 36. So that is a big development. But it'd be interesting to hear from, uh, from the audience in terms of any questions or any observations about pain points uh, that the panel may be able to speak to. So yeah. do we have any, any questions or any observations? So everything is absolutely going crystal <laughs> way. We, <laughs> couldn't, we couldn't hope for a better. Jeff. Oh, I'm keenly interested to understand uh, the role of mentors and your views on them being the catalyst in bringing the community together and really the fertilizer that makes them grow. Maybe you can share some of your insights from the various communities that yeah. uh, I mean, I can uh, take that because when we started in 2008, 2009, there was no concept of mentors in Iceland, <laughs> right? I was actually the first mentor, literally. And then I think Höykur and I, we used to actually go to startup weekends and we'll be the only two mentors. You know, there'll be like 150 people there wanting to do something over the weekend and there'll be nobody to guide them. <laughs> and we'll be running around trying to one table to the other. Um, so that more or less, was how it was. But once we started talking to people about mentoring and pulling them in and saying, you don't have to be an expert to be a mentor, right? And, and, and just literally stalking them to come. <laughs> uh, that kind of changed the ecosystem a bit. And then we got a mentorship-driven accelerator. Like, uh, you know, we, we established one in Iceland in 2012 called Startup Reykjavik. And then they went and got a lot of service providers and others into the play. So mentors are key to this. And mentors are not those who have always walked the path. Mentors are those who are just out there across mm. the table yeah. listening to you. <laughs> you know. Uh, so if you are an entrepreneur and this is your first startup, guess what? Volunteer as a mentor. You know you would be surprised there are things that you've experienced that somebody else might take value out of. And uh, I've learned so much being a mentor. And, and I do mentoring because I learn. It's not because I share. It's because I learn a lot talking to entrepreneurs. So if, if you want to become a very good student, you need to be a teacher. So assume that role and do that. I, I would say, you know, I, I think it's a great question because mentoring as a giving, because mentoring is a giving process. And if you continue to give, you would get tremendous dividends back. I mean, one, one of the things I would also uh, do, Jeff, is uh, now having done mentor camp and having mentored you know, uh, a, a fair, I think about 1,200 companies now, what's really interesting is looking at the data from mentoring. And there's this myth that the best mentors are entrepreneurs. Um, if you look at just Atlantic region, the three mentors that get cited all the time um, are Nicole LeBlanc, Sean Carver, and Dawn Umler uh, from Innovacore. And I, I don't, don't mean to embarrass you, Dawn, and, and, and I know Nicole's not here and Sean's not here, uh, but the, the thing about the three of them is they're not, well, Sean is now, but they're not entrepreneurs, uh, and yet they are the most requested uh, uh, mentors to uh, speak to again. So there's this myth, and actually my experience has been, again, this is the data that I've obtained, the more successful the entrepreneur, especially if they have first-time success, they tend to be awful, like awful mentors. Um, to be a good mentor, you have to have a heavy, heavy dose of failure, which is probably why I'm a good mentor, because I've probably had <laughs> lots, seriously, and I'm, I'm, not being, I'm not being falsely modest. I mean, yeah. I've, I've, I've had one success, but I've had so many failures. Um, and I think every time you fail, though, you become a better mentor, and you end up with more of a healthy respect uh, for, sorry, that's a different subject. But, uh, I'd love mm -hmm. to talk about mentoring, sorry, but that, that's, a, that's a different subject we could have for you. Yeah, maybe just from, from the standpoint of, you know, Silicon Valley is over there, US and, and so forth, and there's a sort of a Serbia over, over there and, and sort of Southeast Europe, and, and, and there is a big divide. And there is a, uh, however, uh, to, to, to the point that you made, 
there's like mentoring on how to run a tech startup, doing a growth, doing a product market fit, and so forth. So, so that knowledge can be imported from the, these major markets through Skype, through having people visit, establish the, the relationship, and so forth. But um, stuff like like what's going in the entrepreneurial um, entrepreneurs' mind and their fear and doubt and uncertainty. Um, those things should should be should be sort of addressed. Not a tactical skills, but very important for for the entrepreneur to early face the fears that they have. And I, I guess for for Halifax, the companies that we met yesterday, and and the companies that we work in Serbia, great technical talent, no go to market skills at all. And and yet we are selling stuff here that's not tech startups. So so there are mentors here that can help on that. Uh, uh, side quite a lot and prepare the, the startups one and then two you know yeah we are not in 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 the major markets but to the point of a doll doll making uh, l um, lady in Iceland you know the only way to to look at the startup is 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 really sort of a global market we, we are not a regional play mm -hmm. so so it's it's ideal for a startup immediately to kind of launch up so so it's in terms of we're not going against each other in the market because that's not where the market is, we are going for the global market. So we're raising the flag up, and 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 with the with sales guidance, we can actually develop for those global markets immediately. So uh, um, there are local mentors that don't necessarily appear to be local mentors, but they they can be and and are. Thank you, thank you for it, Steve. I want to ask you a very difficult question. Actually, um, I apologize. How do you, once you get the status that Communitech has, and I think uh, other organizations, Propel, uh, have, I'm sure have this problem as well, how do you stop um, bad mentors or people who can have a detrimental effect getting involved? Because all, all advice comes from a good place, but not all advice is good advice. And how do you, or do, do you not have that issue? <laughs> sorry, it's a very that's difficult that's question, sorry. That's an easy one, right? Yeah. Um, as far as bad mentorship. So, you know, one of the things we hear from a lot of entrepreneurs around mentors is that um, they talk to one person and they're really smart and they've got some great ideas and then they talk to the next person and they're really smart and they've got some slightly different ideas and then it just keeps going on. And then at some point they get paralyzed and they just don't know what to do or they, they start pivoting every time they talk to someone. So it's uh, it's a bit of a challenge so uh, you know a lot of it is just you know <coughs> understanding as an entrepreneur that it's your business and you have to be the driver and make those decisions and filter out uh the good from the bad as well so that um you know you take that responsibility but pick and choose what you can from the experts that you have access to thank you are there any sally so can i just before we answer the question i think just in case uh, people didn't hear it Question, Sally, and correct me if I'm wrong in paraphrasing it. It's basically, it's always the same people stepping forward, driving initiatives, how, and then those people get exhausted. How do you uh, make sure, are there any tips that you might have of how to ensure that other people step up to kind of run initiatives? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I try to do, which is again, you know, uh, going back to my mentor, Brad Feld, he talks about giving people assignments, right? So when you are doing an initiative and you're doing something and somebody comes and says, hey, this is great, uh, I, I want to help, you know, give them assignments, <laughs> right? Give, give a task to them and say, hey, by the way, I'm going to do a meetup for next week and you will lead that and I will help you. I will be your, your helper. So you lead the effort. And I think it needs to be an effort that kind of builds on itself that way. Uh, at least it, it's worked well in Iceland. We, we try to make sure, uh, you know, I, I, I drive some initiatives. Some initiatives we basically pull people and we basically let them drive and we just act as helpers. And uh, it, there's no, you know, secret sauce to this. It's just, uh, we just have to uh, push the community. Uh, you know, but, but, you know, you're right. You know, people get burnt out. You know, my wife's got burnt out. She's like, how long are you going to keep doing this? <laughs> <laughs> the, m maybe one, one thing that, that um, we are trying to do is, is to try to show uh, success. And, and somebody at the panel before was talking about, you know, we are trying to do a billion dollar exit and so forth. So, so I, th I think it's okay to do an acquire. I think it's okay to have a million dollar exit. 
because that puts a positive energy in back into the mix. And uh, in all honesty, a lot of the founders really don't have the material to be a $100 million exit. Most of the guys who are at the panel here, it's second exit, third exit. So, so I, I, I think I think it's okay to to learn, you know, get to, to to that next step, and that's a positive energy coming back in, because if it's for two years, nothing's happening, um, people will burn out. Steve, yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I think there's there's a couple angles maybe to to build on Voya's uh, comment as well. Uh, there's nothing like success that breeds uh, enthusiasm and and more success. And I think you mentioned earlier about this notion of, of density or, or a center of gravity. And, and it kind of, you, if you can get the combination of the two of those working together, and your center of gravity doesn't necessarily have to be physical, it could be virtual as well, given that Atlantic Canada has a lot of pockets of activity. And so can you bring those, those groups together, even if it's in a virtual fashion, to kind of build and feed off of each other's successes and create a sense of excitement around what is happening within you know, the overall tech community and so that other people want to get involved and to, to join in and, and be part of something that is, is successful. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, uh, New York, people are very, very time conscious, very time conscious. Uh, Sally asks a great question. How, how do people in New York ensure that there's a fresh rotation of people and fresh mentors? Because every time I come to New York and mentor some companies, I see fresh mentors. How do you keep that going? Well, because there's uh, a plethora of, of them, I'd say. But uh, it's, uh, well, when, when someone, to talk about the, the first person that, that's going and getting burned out, uh, I don't know if you remember the video from YouTube where the guy's dancing crazy and then eventually the whole crowd is dancing like he is. It, he was that lone nut and uh, you know, it's being that follower. There's a lot of that going on and, and it gets really specific, sp particularly in New York. Uh, someone will have a, you know, a startup about, uh, I don't know, there's a, uh, urban farming, right? So urban farming is kind of taking off and someone's really trying to get there. And there's a lot of people in the, that it, you wouldn't think of agriculture in New York, um, but there's a lot of people with experience within the city. And so they, uh, a lot of people recognize that this guy was you know, saying, hey, let's get this. Um, you're out there, you are, there's that lone nut out there, you should be supporting them. That it's, the more people that jump in, you're much more valuable than you realize if you have, like you guys said earlier, just a little bit experience is a lot for these guys. And so for building that community, really recognize who that is and support them and put them on a pet pedestal and then also be that person yourself. Uh, uh, I, I can also add one more thing. You know, if you're a startup and let's say you're building something and you need to find a very good Java developer just a random thought. A good way to do that is to do a Java meetup. <laughs> Guess what? There are going to be a ton of people who are going to show up interested in Java. and you, It could be a facility to, for you to recruit somebody. So it's not always about you know, this bigger goal of building a community. It could be as selfish as you just having a problem in your startup and you want to solve it mm -hmm. and make the community come together and solve it for you. Right. And in order to do that, you right. gain something, but you also help the community by doing a meetup. So there, there are positive things that come out of just picking on everybody's brain. And, and uh, I, I, I encourage all the mentor, uh, all the startups that I work with to do things like that. So you know, there's a Node.js meetup in, in Iceland. And it's like 50 people show up and people are like, we didn't even know there were 50 people in Iceland. <laughs> you know, <laughs> how are there 50 Node.js developers in Iceland? So, so it's, it, 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 it's, it's just a matter of just pushing and, and trying to get more people to jump and do things. I mean, one of the, one of the things I do want to mention uh, about, you know, and that exercise where people stood up, you know, be accountable, you know, do, do make sure your voices are heard. And Hawk is actually a great example. So Hawk came here for the first time ever last year's mentor camp. You, you came here as a mentor last year. And you have now moved your business. You've set up a Canadian uh, subsidiary. And in the next three months, so you've been doing your business for six months, and in the next three months, you're going to become the number one uh, cottage uh, rental business in Nova Scotia, which I think is incredible. But more importantly, you've actually become, those of us uh, who've, who've worked with him and, and seen what you do in Volta, you've actually become you know, a community leader. You didn't wait for permission. I think one of the things all of us have got to get over is this worrying about stepping on people's toes. Mm -hmm. We've got to squash people's toes. If people mm -hmm. are complaining about their toes getting squashed, we're not doing our job. Uh, you know, and people have got to get over it. If you're worried about your, this is my bit, get over it. Mm. Um, communities can't start on a basis of asking for permission. It just never works that way. This conference, I don't think anybody asked for permission to host this conference. It just happened. Mm -hmm.
things just happen when you let them. Hulk, question? So when I started my first company in Iceland about 10 years ago, I had nobody there. I had no role models. I didn't know anybody that started a company. It was so difficult for me to go through that process that it kind of resonated with me, and now I feel like I have to help other people. So I did it in the Icelandic community, or at least tried as much as I could while I was working on my own startup. And I just I started enjoying it so much, so I love kind of taking part in that. Thank you. And I think uh, when we talk about ecosystem development, that's a very good point. Sometimes places, and, and we've got two guys from Arkansas uh, who've come all the way from Arkansas for this. So thank you guys. I'm sorry I couldn't wear your T-shirt, but uh, they gave me a T-shirt to wear, but it was large. And I thought the chances of somebody from Arkansas having an extra, extra, extra large T-shirt was quite strong, but uh, apparently they weren't. But, um, but um, one of the things with places like Arkansas and Halifax is how wealth has been made. So I think in places mm. where the wealth is dynastic or has come from something like retail, they are very loath to invest in startups, whereas when you go to places like Denver, Seattle, uh, because there's a culture of making money through startups, there is that PayPal mafia that I, I've never heard that before. I love that. I absolutely mm -hmm. love that. I'm going to use that a lot. Uh, there is that PayPal mafia. And if you look at the, who the leaders are, uh, people like Jerry Pond, people like Jeff Thompson, uh, people like Jeff McDonald, these are people who've actually are, are, are part of the PayPal mafia, I guess. So great question. Thank you. Please. You all have a few things in common. I'm just curious how women factor into your respective ecosystem. Yes. So, so, yeah. so uh. the question was, the question was, um, obviously you need a man repeating the question. I apologize. It would be great if we had a woman here. Um, <laughs> but um, the question was, um, we, all have, we all share some things in common um, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, women involvement in the tech scenes. Um, what comments do we have? Or well, how do they factor into the respective communities? Because some are small, some are large. Obviously, New York, New York has no women. But I'm just curious. Yeah, from from in 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 Thank our you. case, it's 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 very sort of interesting the the the, the communist background that we have. The, the the women's rights and sort of equality was there from a get go. The salaries were the same. It, so so the women's movement um, was very strong. And actually, in the technical schools, when I was there as a as a, a student, which is long, long time ago, it was actually like mechanical engineering had a thirty percent girls, seventy percent boys. So now it's kind of fifty fifty. Uh, so you see that in 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 the meetups, it is fifty fifty girls and boys, which is tremendous actually. So so we um, it almost like you don't need to make a particular effort to. To prop up the the uh, the women, uh, they are they are there, um, and and uh, so so that's that's great. I'm 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 so glad that we just need to support what's what's there and don't need to make extra effort. So can I can I just sorry um, I don't want us to answer that question. And the reason I don't want, I don't want us to ask answer that question is I actually want to ask you, what do we need to do? What do communities not we? What do communities need to do to get more women involved? I think they need to ask. Can I ask two more women? I'd like to ask two more women about, uh, and if you've got some specific examples, I'd, I'd love to hear. Can I ask two more women uh, for a response, please? I think it has to start earlier, but I, I fully agree with what you're saying. It has to start in schools, younger school levels, with education in the STEM and supporting females going through the STEM programs, because as soon as they hit university, less than 2% go into engineering. And there has to be some way of facilitating that or supporting that with scholarships for women or whatnot to get them in there so they actually have that educational base that we can pull from later. It, it was interesting, three weeks ago, for the first time ever in American history, there were more non-whites in schools in America than whites. And I think it'd be great if we had a, uh, a date set where perhaps two years from now, three years from now, where we have more females doing STEM courses than men. I mean, I, mean, I mean, those are the kind of targets I think we need to set ourselves and hold leaders accountable to. So you had a specific thing you want to say? I to just uh, uh, maybe a piece of data. Uh, I was down at Google and Mountain View a, co a couple weeks ago, and they've got a huge initiative on women in technology and in the workplace. And so they trotted out a few stats, which I think the, uh, the females in the audience would be happy to hear, is that uh, 
uh, companies that have at least one female board member tend to be, I think, 20-ish, 25% more profitable. And then uh, they've also got some stats around, you know, if there is one female as part of the founding team, that companies usually are, you know, that much more successful as well. So it's, uh, there's some good stats out there that, that show that uh, it's, it's important. Please. One of the things, I think, when it comes to like Communitech, for example, a couple weeks ago they did a women entrepreneurship boot camp sponsored by Google, a 44 program. So I was down there facilitating that. And they had women entrepreneurs literally fly in from England and from Halifax to participate in a Waterloo program. So women are looking for those programs. Mm -hmm. One of the reality checks that came through during that three days that I realized, because it was the first time I really participated in a women's event, and I usually get away from it, <laughs> was that women are typically very realistic. Um, or you don't see very many women randomly jumping off bridges versus guys do. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a really clear example. So if you're talking about risk taking, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship, women tend to be realistic. We think through, we know that the reality is that we're going to fail. So we're very meticulous in terms of every little move we play. But Sally, can I ask you a question? Because you said something very interesting, which is you normally stay away from these things. Why? Because um, I've always been in a male dominated industry, and it's the military or aviation. So I'm, I don't, I personally don't feel that I need the women group support, but going to that event made me realize how some women do, and it kind of opened up my eyes in terms of some of the opportunities in that. And they were kick-ass too. Yeah, they were I saw the, really I saw the tweets. Yeah. So I, I, would, I would just challenge you, Sally. I think it's not that you don't need necessarily, you, you know, may not perceive that you need the group, but I think the group needs you and more people like you. So I think sometimes we, it's, it's all about the payback model. Uh, it's not about whether the groups need, uh, we, will, we need the groups. I think the groups need us. Um, that's, uh, that's just, sorry, that's not my job to challenge. Sorry, I'm getting carried away as, a, as I'm supposed to be chairing this panel. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Mike, do you have any, any, any comments at all? We've talked a lot about everything, and I, I love the fact that you've got so much experience in. Uh, sure. Uh, so I, women run New York, I think, in, in many ways. Uh, it depends on the industry, I guess, I, in terms of um, fashion and the media. Well, it says women dominate it. But, um, but anyway, in New York, uh, there's kind of a joke that no matter what, uh, sports team or country that you're from, you can go to a bar and watch your team uh, in, in, in New York. You, you'll have your people. Your tribe is there no matter where you're from. And in the startup world, it's the same. So if you do have people coming down and visiting, there's people from uh, Halifax there that have a group. There's people that have snake startups there. Uh, they, they are there. So when you're there, definitely contact me, and I'm happy to introduce. But um, your tribes are there, and I think it's a, it's a great market. It was mentioned a ton of times on stage today, so it is a good way for Canadian companies to inject into the American market is through New York. Uh, so definitely don't be hesitant to uh, look up those folks there. And you asked me earlier, my secret is um, I find people via Twitter list. It's very simple. Do a couple key terms, and you'll find very specific people very quickly and ask them to meet up. Okay. We, we've run out of time, sadly. Yep. Um, so unless there are any quick, last, very quick questions, please. Okay, quick one on the women in technology issues. So um, we are Digital Nova Scotia. I'm the president and CEO, and we do actually very actively do initiatives on women in technology in this province, starting with digital discovery camps or computer camps where youngsters 10 to 15 years of age can do video game development, anything you like. And we have a lot of females, young females participate. And um, the status of Women Canada, we received funding for senior level women. We do a power it up, we do a lot actually, together with Volta and other groups, entrepreneurs from the payment, and uh, it has been going extremely well. So anybody who doesn't know and wants to reach out, please <coughs> come to us, you're always invited. And it's not really about women, it's about men and women having the discussion and actually companies looking for talent, whether that's immigrant, females, you name it. Thank you. Thank you, Ulrika, thank you very much, thank you, thank you. Um, the thing I love about these panels is you never know uh, where, where the conversation is going to go. So thank you very much for, to the audience for helping steer us this, uh, steer this conversation. So this is the last panel of the day. So can we just have one sound bite in terms of positive advice for um, the communities in Atlantic Canada from a startup? Mike, I'll start with you. One I'll positive I'll comment. I'll say what I said again. It's just about bridging those communities. Uh, CSA in Toronto opened. We opened up a, a co-working space in New York. And they send busloads of people down from Toronto for the parties in New York. Those, gap, those bridges are there. You guys are building it between Halifax and Iceland and Arkansas and Raleigh, and it's great. Um, continue to build those bridges. Follow very quickly. 
Um, just do it and do more faster. Thank you. Great. Voya? <laughs> just to those who stand up and, uh, I mean, stood up to, to just don't ask for any permissions and just do what you, what you feel you want to do. Steve? Think big. Canadian startups are every bit as good as startups from anywhere else in the world. Go after and go after more than your fair share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the panel and thank you very much to the audience. Thank you. Great.